Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Bless his name that he allowed us together one more time to do, to lift him up, to praise him, to tell others about him and making sure that they know that he came to take away our sins. And as we are doing all those things, doing the Great Commission, he is also seeking to bring unity. That is our title for today. And it is in 2 Corinthians. You know, we've been in 1 Corinthians a long time. And now we're in 2 Corinthians. We are in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, starting with the fourth verse, all the way to the 17th verse. And we are just trying to get an understanding of Christian forgiveness and biblical ministry. We can't know it all. We have to study and study. And when, and when do we stop? Never. Study and study and study some more. And as God opened up our understanding, we still haven't gotten anywhere as far as our knowledge because we not even a pinpoint the little bit we know. Well, we thank God for using us and, and you know, blessing us to be able to do a work for him for it is an honor. And so now we might think, what does a life of triumph look like? You know, what, what does a life uh, uh, that everything is great, is that, a, is that a great life? Everything is just wonderful. Nothing is happening. And every time we ask God for something, he just, the prayer is answered. And, and we just talk to God on one and one. And, and I said, God, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said to me, um, you know this. And we just had a conversation. Uh, I mean, I see that sometimes. Uh, I don't understand that, but here we go. But what does a life look like? It is not a life free from problems, free from challenges. You know, we just you know, ask God and everything just go right. That's not what it's all about. It's not a life from trouble. We'll find out this as we look at Apostle Paul in this lesson as he meet the challenge that is in his life, facing all types of trouble, people, we'll see what true victory, we will see what true victory is all about. You know, many times we see things happening to people and we say, ah, oh, what is God, God doing? Is he punishing? They must have, we're looking at it. And many times we hear people all the time say, well, if all of this happened because you don't have enough faith or because this happened or because that happened. And, and, and we look into our lesson here. Paul is a person that had all kinds of problems, all kinds of trouble. What, is the Bible to be our example or not? Or, or do we take out the part we don't want to be our example and we just put in that part that says, uh, what did we ask God for? He's going to give it to us. You know, I, that's not quoting, but that's, you know, you know, and, but, but never mind his will, just whatever I want. Never mind. Never mind about the trials and tribulation he tells us we must go through to make us strong. We, we don't want to talk about that, those scriptures too much, but we look in the, in the book here and starting from Genesis all the way. God's people went through problems. So let's look here. Let's look in verse 4, chapter 2, 2 Corinthians. It says, for, our, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye shall be grieved, but that ye might, may, might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you, which I have more abundantly unto you. Listen to what Paul is saying here. For out of much, M-U-C-H, much affliction, much, not some, not a small amount, but out of much affliction. Now, is that some way that that does not come over to be much affliction? Um, does that come out to say, um, well, he was having a affliction, but, you know, I mean, it is, right out in plain language, much affliction. For out of much affliction, Paul is saying, he wrote this letter. 
Okay? With many tears, he said. He said, but not, I'm not writing you so that you can be upset about this, so that you've been grieved. But he's saying, I am writing you this, that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. He's writing to the uh, current, to the people of current, letting them know. They don't have to be upset. He said, even though he's having all this pain, don't worry about it. Because he, had, he said he just wants them to know the love that he had for them. But if ye any have cause to grieve, it said in verse 5, but if any have cause grief, he has not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted a many, so that contrawise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should sw be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. Now, what is Paul saying? Paul told the Corinthian people that the offender, the person that did something wrong, had caused pain, not so much to him, you know, whoever it is that did it to him, but he caused it not to him personally, but to the whole church, to the body of Christ, that person. See, See, he's telling them that sin is always like that. It affects not just one person, but it affects many more people than we even think that it does. Just one, one thing that a person uh, uh, do affects many, many people. But he is telling them that even though the church can err in failing to discipline and also in discipline without understanding the motivation for restoring, such was the call case in this passage that he's talking about. Discipline had reached its goal when it had produced true uh, repentance. Okay? So even so, all this happened, Paul is saying in verse 8, Wherefore I beseech ye that ye will confirm your love toward that person, no matter what. They have done the hope of discipline. And even though pain affected, he's telling them to confirm their love for that person. Let's look, see what verse 9 said. For to this end, for to this end also did I write. So he's telling them uh, another reason why he's writing. For this end that I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. He said, no matter what is going on, when a person has repented and did all the things, he wanted to make sure that you are, are doing what God will have you to do about them, that person or a group or whatever it may be. Because he's trying to, Paul is seeking to bring unity. And we don't want them to separate over something. This discipline has produced repentance in the life of the offender. You hear that? That person had done wrong. The discipline that he had, had has produced repentance in the life of the offender when we do it God's way. Now, he needs to be forgiven. He needs to be forgiven and he needs to be comforted. You know, that person, that offender. And Paul is letting them know a failure to do this, a failure to receive forgiveness, open one's life up to excessive sorrow. You know, you just don't want to, you know, just beat a person down, even though they have done wrong, and just make them feel, I mean, they already know they are wrong and they're guilty, and you just won't let them raise their head up. Every time they try to do, uh, you're going to bring it up and just browbeat them, and, and they, just, they just accuse them all types of way. And so... The church, the body of Christ, to an offender was urged, that's, what, that's that unity we are seeking, was urged to reaffirm their love for this man, this person. The church is asked to do that. They're urged to do it, urged to do it, to reaffirm their love. Forgiveness, comfort, 
and affirming love does something. I say forgiveness, comfort, and affirming love does something. It make up the threefold medicine that a repentant heart needs. You know that? When you, a person has repented, it needs someone, you know, they are sorry from the heart. They're really sorry. Then they need someone to forgive them for their wrongness. They need someone to comfort them, to encourage them, to affirm them that they are loved even though they, that thing, that offense, that whatever they did. Okay? So let's go back to nine. I read over, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sake forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Furthermore, when I came to uh, Troy to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened unto me, of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Okay, verse 10. We're back, back to verse, well, really 9 and 10. Paul here is conspiring to the Corinthian people, and then he had a special purpose. He's a specific purpose. It was to bring them to a test of faith. You hear this? To bring them to a test of faith. The test will give them an opportunity to express love and obedience. This test, God bring that in our life, people, that we can express. Some tests we're going through to see what we're gonna, how we're going to act on it. Somebody did us wrong or somebody might not have done you wrong, but you thought they did you wrong. And how did you act? We, we holy, uh, uh, blood ball, uh um, emotional praising of God people. How do we act when something happened, when we went through a test? Would God be pleased of our response? Would he, would, would he be pleased with it? He gave us a test. We always going through tests that we are belong to Christ. That's, yes, we are. And this test that they was having would give them an opportunity to express their love and obedience. The, the letter that Paul wrote referred to uh, in verse 9 is the same one as we talked about in verse 3 and 4. Self-will can express itself in a zealous commitment to do right. That's self-will right there. In this case, the Corinthian people were being tempted to punish the brother on the discipline too severely. You know, he's done something and they want to do it in their way. Not, now, these are Christian people that God has told how to do things, but they want to do it that way. The solution was for their obedience to express itself in loving forgiveness of this person. How many of us uh, can forgive everything, anything? Oh, we say, oh, yes. We'll tell somebody else, if this happened to you, you should forgive that person because this is what the Bible said. And the Bible said, you know, forgive everything. But when something happened to you, to us, it's something else when you're punning and you're telling somebody else to do all the forgiveness. But when it's our time, when, when our wife or our husband or our children or our friend or our whatever have done us wrong, where is that holy forgiveness then? Where is it? If, it? if the word is for you out there, then it's for me also. And if you telling me that suffer through whatever and do it God's way, then it's my time to suffer. It's my testing time to suffer and go through that thing. Yes, we must learn to do that and we can't do it other than through Christ Jesus because there's many things that hurt us to our heart I'm not saying it does not hurt us to our heart that our loved one would do such a thing sometimes things are embarrassing to us and we just don't know what to do 
but we can know that God will still want us to forgive because he forgives us if God, if that person that have hurt me or you so bad will go to God and tell God to forgive them and they are sincerely asking from their heart, guess what God would do? If they repented, would not God forgive them? Well, of course, I know we're not God, but we are supposed to try with Jesus showing us how to have to let this mind be in us that is also in Christ Jesus. Oh, I'm not saying it's easy, but we can do it. How do I say that? Because God said I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I always have to say that. I said it before because I can't do anything on my own because if I had to do some of these things that I'm telling, talking about here, hard things that, you know, loved ones and, and, and friends and all have done to, we, we say, no, 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 no. We can't do it. We can't go. We don't want to. It is too hurting. But with God, we can do it. Okay. So when someone obeyed God, he would stand behind the person action. In the situation they had current, that was expressed by the assurance that the apostle Paul would stand behind the people's forgiveness. He act as Christ's representative in, in Christ's authority and in his presence. He was in his presence. You hear that? In his presence. Such is the nature of that apostle Paul, okay? So God commands are motivated by his goodness. The commands are to forgive, comfort, and reaffirm love to the person that repent, okay? A failure to do, listen at this, a failure to do that will allow the man to be swallowed up in sorrow. Do we want a person to be swallowed up in sorrow? Sometimes we do. Because, oh, he, he or she hurt me so bad, I'm glad they're unhappy. I'm glad, but we shouldn't be glad. It is not God's way, and we want to be the way of God, okay? But when a person, when a person is in sorrow, that we know that in this condition, Satan would get an advantage, and we don't want Satan to get advantage of a brother in Christ Jesus. That's why so many of our people, brothers in, in Christ, will fall because, uh, you know, we go to the people who's supposed to be the loving people, who, who's supposed to be uh, of God. And they come and they find out we're we, 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 we so wrapped up in ourselves, even though we have Jesus. Jesus is our person to save you. But we, this is because, you know what, who is Paul writing to here? He's writing to the city of Corinth. This people here are not unsaved people he's talking to. He's talking to believers. Believers. And why is he telling them these things? Because somebody was not doing the right thing. And that's why the word, word is here to continue to tell us how to act, what to do, how to do. Because we don't always do the right thing. Thank God he loves us. Thank God. Because we deserve nothing, 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 okay? And so we don't want to have this person, just the, the, the devil get the advantage. We are not to be ignorant of, of Satan now because Satan devices. He, he, he's, he's out there and he's, he's cunning. He knows we, uh, his schemes and his plot. We as, his, as, as God's children have to be wise. We're not to be ignorant. And we will be ignorant. We don't know the word. Our prayer should be for the Lord to teach us all we need to know in order to live in the victory, in the victory life of Christ. Live in the victory of Christ. You hear this? And guess what? Satan is always on his job. Even when we're praying and asking God, asking him to lead us, to teach us all that we need to do. You think Satan going to go away just because we're doing that? No, Satan will try to get what does not belong to him. He always do. He attempt to gain influence over the believer and over the Lord's church. Yes, that's his job. But God wants us to live totally submitted, submitted 
life and to resist the devil in all his attempts to deceive and distract us. He has all the, let's think about the world out there. He has all kinds of things out there. And we find ourselves wrapped up in it. And guess what? We find ourselves going along with the saying of the world. World. The Bible say uh, one thing and, and the Bible, the world say, oh, well, you know, it's not all that. This is the, the new millennium. And, and it's, it's a, um, it, it used to be this is the 90s. And, and now that the 90s have passed, oh, this is the 2000 here. And, and, you know, we don't live like that anymore. And it's okay. And everything's okay. Guess what? It's okay because you said it's okay. No, it isn't. God's word didn't change for me. It is not going to change for you. Whatever he still say, he still mean it. He didn't change for none of us. God still want us to live totally submitted life and to resist the devil in all his attempt to deceive and distract us, God's children. That's what he wants. You can find that in James, the fourth chapter and the seventh verse. You want to look that up. One must how many daily, not just one must daily deal with inner bitterness and lack of forgiveness in our lives so as to not to open up a door of opportunity for Satan. Because so, as soon as the, uh, something happened to us, let's say you're driving down the street and some nut almost make you run out the street and going on and you're a person of God and, and, and uh, here you just going on minding your own business. And before you know it, if you're not watching, you have that person might hear not hear you. And sometimes you just blowing your horn and you want to catch up to the person, roll down your window and tell them off and, and all that stuff. And what is coming out of our mouth? Hmm? What? Daily. This is why this is a daily thing. This is daily. Daily we have to wake up and say, Lord, help me to live like you have me to live. Unity in you. He's seeking us to be uni united together as brothers doing his will, okay? We cannot uh, think we can get up today and eat for next week. Do we eat for next week and say, well, I'm just going to eat all the food I need to eat today and I won't have to eat next week? No, that's not right. You eat today. And tomorrow, you're going to be hungry. As a matter of fact, you may be hungry in a few hours. Okay? Just like we can't eat for tomorrow and next week, we, our prayer for today is for today. And we must do this thing daily so Satan won't get a, a, a foothold. A lack of assurance of forgiveness after one has repented can lead, can lead to despair. And give Satan an opportunity to work also. You see, when you pray and we say, oh, I wonder did God forgive me. You see, we don't want, we want to make sure that we know God said he forgive us. He knows your heart. He's no shorter than his promise. And as we are sincere, he knows when we are. Let me read real fast here. Uh, Paul is talking. Now I'm reading 14. I'm going to go all the way and read to 17. Then I'm going back. Now thank be unto God, which also caused us to triumph in Christ and make manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet Savior of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the Savior of death unto death and to the other the Savior of life unto life. And who is this sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as unsincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ, in Christ Jesus. So now here Paul was traveling and he was traveling to preach the gospel. And the gospel, you all already know, the gospel is the good news about Jesus. It is. He is the good news. It is the good news of Christ's death. It is resurrection. Praise God. That is the basic, listen at this, for our forgiveness, for our deliverance, for our empowerment. Listen at this. And direction. And so, in verse 12, the B part, the phrase, a door was opened, indicate that it was God who opened this door, or opportunity. 
It wasn't my good mind or your good mind. He can open doors that man can, no man can shut, okay? The, um, the Greek verb in our text indicate that God had opened the door and had kept it open. Unto me indicate that God is a personal God who opened the doors for individuals, for us. Or the Lord indicate not only that the Lord opened the door, but also that the opportunity is to be used to serve him. Now that the door is open, the opportunity to go in and do whatever the door is open, that is an opportunity for us to serve him. So wherever some door was open, some job that you couldn't get and you don't understand that it really wasn't because of some great thing we did, but something happened that you got in there now. That, that you are in there, it is an opportunity, an opportunity to serve him. All of the, the trials involve, the trials involve wondering how his earlier letter had been received. Titus had delivered that letter, but Paul had not been able to find Titus. And so here he was not understanding that he had no rest in his spirit while he continued to wait. Okay, a true ministry Minister is not self-motivated. He's motivated. He's not self-drive. He's trying to do a work. A true minister is motivated and empowered by God's spirit. He lives before God and in union with Christ as he seeks to minister. Okay? Seeking, seeking, seeking to bring unity. Okay. Study that lesson. And we will see you next time.